Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, November 25th, 2021, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys, well, I got a very exciting video for you today about the good giants. Okay, and anybody new to this channel or just checking out this video for the first time here, you're going to be surprised to hear about the good giants because you don't hear about good giants anywhere. All you hear about is the cannibalistic Nephilim and the L.A. Marzulis of the world who want to promote this idea about the giants, even though... When we go over the profile points of the giants one by one, they were more advanced, they brought metallurgy, they taught farming to us, etc., etc., again and again and again, about all their teachings, the big men of Iroquois legend, and the good giants from the Algonquin legends, which we're going to talk about one of them today, just a fantastic story that I think you're going to really enjoy of the myths and legends of the Algonquin people who apparently had no problem with the giants and in fact had a lot to learn from the giants so we're going to read that story today but before we even get into it we're going to take a look at who the Algonquin people were and where they were and so we have a full understanding of what we're talking about here okay so the Algonquin peoples the Algonquin are one of the most populous and widespread North American native language groups historically the peoples were prominent along the Atlantic coast and into the interior along the St. Lawrence River and around the Great Lakes this grouping consists of the peoples who speak Algonquin languages. Okay, so right away how they highlight the Atlantic coast. Okay, these were people who were like maritime, maritime seafaring people. Okay, a lot of their folklore and traditions have to do with aquatic things. Okay. And often, William A. Ritchie, who was the head archaeologist of New York State, would frequently uh, dig up these artifacts where there would be these oversized harpoons. Now, get this. It's not a spear. It's a harpoon. An oversized one that no human being of average size today would be possibly be able to handle. Okay, he called them votive, but in tradition with the Algonquin peoples of being these maritime seafaring people, and a lot of their mythology has to do with these sorts of things, okay, that my side in Maori, my own research project, which you can see right here on my channel, which not a lot of people go to, but I show you all these fantastic things in a remote place in upstate Connecticut, rural upstate Connecticut, a pristine um, stone wall area with many effigies and many other things going on and just fantastic. And uh, we'll talk about that later on too. We just have to go over some of the things there that, you know, come to a better understanding of things. But in any case, you know, these Algonquin people, um, were around the waterways and concentrated Mary on a sort of maritime thing. So they were consuming a lot of the, you know, stuff that you could find in bodies of water, fish. And again, Jimmy and I had found in the remote places there in Vermont a fishing weir and a sluice built out it's just ancient construction it was just unbelievable i had photos of it but my laptop was stolen from, you know from my luggage there as i traveled um on uh greyhound there across the united states going to various areas but 
Okay, so you have the Algonquin people here, and the main focus of them was around these bodies of water and the maritime theme, which is certainly what the Maori site, my research site, is all about. And you can find in Algonquin legend, it's very interesting to me, this underwater panther, which a lot of people take as the horned serpent too, but I don't believe it is. I believe it's specifically what they say it is, this underwater panther. Okay, but again, you know, even mainstream researchers think this might have been a real creature that lived in the waters here. It's in lakes, Lake Champlain, Lake George are huge lakes here in New York State. And the Great Lakes are sort of just huge inland oceans where these creatures supposedly lived. And there's probably a lot of fact to this because there were creatures that lasted through the Holocene, the early Holocene, that were just gigantic and were odd and just, you know, they didn't have any counterparts to continue on, smaller counterparts to continue on into the future. But this certainly might have been a real creature, this underwater panther. And this is the main thing that these people are associated with. Again, I say that they did not consume a lot of red meat only for ceremonial purposes when they needed the highs, they needed the raw materials that these animals provided for, you know, whatever they needed. Although we heard about going on into the far ancient past about these people wearing weaved bark tunics and other with fabrics as well. So no need for animal skins if you have fabric and woven bark tunics, etc. So things to note, but it's just interesting about this is often taken as a horned serpent, but it's this underwater panther. So it could have been one of these creatures that existed during the Pleistocene, late Pleistocene, into the early Holocene. And many of the histories and story of the Algonquin people we get from Charles G. Leland, who studied these things and wrote a book about it. And one of the things that he noted in his book that some of the Algonquin mythology seemed very similar to Norse mythology. Okay, so right away people are going to say, well, it's because, you know, Vikings were over there and they made contact with these people somewhere in the past, which may be certainly be true. And I think it was. But not for that reason, okay, it's because of this unified society across the northern hemisphere that spanned between Europe and North America with the large hominids, the Adena and Bell Beaker people who were, are almost identical to the Adena, except the Adena were bigger, but almost the same physiology same skeletal structure with vaulted craniums, almost identical. Okay, so the Vikings, you know, got this from their ancient past, these legends, and so did the people, the Algonquin people, you know, in the Americas, because it was taken from this ancient society that existed there in the past. And look, you know, there's more evidence to support this whole thing with these um, large hominids, humanoids from the past with vaulted craniums on both sides of the Atlantic, when the Atlantic was lower and many of the island bodies that, you know, were above waterline were around, people could skip from island to island pretty easily, and they were. The Americas were visited many, many times, even before the Vikings, okay? way, way back into the ancient past. It's just a whole story about Christopher Columbus discovering America is nothing but a complete fairy tale. Okay.
you know, based on his retelling of history, rewriting of history. But many of these legends are gotten from um, Charles Leland here. And, you know, he's the first one to put this together. And it's interesting to note of the similarity between the Algonquin legends and the Norse legends. Interesting, very interesting. So let's take a look at this and we'll read a little bit about the Algonquin people so a little bit further because I want to talk about it a little bit. Before Europeans came into contact, most Algonquian settlements lived by hunting and fishing, and I say primarily fishing, although quite a few supplemented their diet by cultivating corn, beans, and squash, the three sisters. The Ojibwe cultivated wild rice, so they had wild rice as well. Rice, potatoes, all these things. I think we're genetically, um, you know, genetically created in somewhere in the distant past because this corn just is the indicator. And I'm not going to go into corn right now, but corn is impossible, just is impossible. Okay, so let's just read this one paragraph here because I want to make a point. At the time of the first European settlements in North America, Algonquin peoples occupied what is now New Brunswick and much of what is now Canada, east of the Rocky Mountains, what is now New England, New Jersey, southeastern New York, Delaware, and down the Atlantic coast to the Upper South and around the Great Lakes in present-day Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa. The homeland of the Algonquin peoples is not known. At the time of the European arrival, hege the hegemonic Iroquois Confederacy, based in present-day New York and Pennsylvania, was regularly at war with, Al with Algonquin neighbors. Okay, so... Just remember that the Iroquois peoples, the Haudenosaunee, came from somewhere else. A Cornell professor says from the Ohio Valley, most likely. Okay. So they're sort of latecomers to the region. They had to displace whoever was there, whether it was giants or anything else. But it's very curious to me that we have these legends in Algonquin um, folklore that have to do with the good giants, okay? Right adjacent to Iroquois territory where the giants were bad, okay? So they were um, the stone giants, okay? which just so happens to be in these places where all this is the New Hampshire stone wall mapper, and here's all the stone walls in this small area of New Hampshire. Okay, here's where Jimmy is, my buddy Jimmy, Jimmy the Paleo Mountain Man, who has his own YouTube channel, okay? lives adjacent to this area here in New Hampshire. And his the area here in Vermont looks exactly like this, okay? Where you see these convoluted wall areas. It's just impossible that colonists and settlers would build all these walls. It's just, it would take over 2,000 years for 15,000 men to build these walls that would go from here and, you know, halfway to the moon, or almost all the way to the moon, okay, 500,000 miles of stone walls for some reason, okay, I was up there with Jimmy the Paleo Mountain Mayor, and he's one of the walls on his property, okay, which Jim Vieira believes they were built by large humanoids, okay, and so do I, 
Okay, I believe this wall tells the whole story here on Jimmy's property. Here I am up with Jimmy. I'm just not a guy sitting in the basement here in his mama's house, you know, looking at the computer. I was out there. I've been there, done that. And you can see all my exploits there in Vermont and in um, Connecticut, upstate Connecticut, in the Green Mountains there. You know, taking a close look at these things. Okay, and this is the largest, most complex mega city in the world, anywhere in the world, with 500,000 miles of stonewall constructions, archaic stonewall constructions built by a people we don't know anything about. But... The uh, Iroquois were at war with the Algonquin people. So, does it seem surprising to you that the stone giants of Iroquois legend, these hostile giants, and they're not made of stone, and they don't have stone armor on them or anything. We heard so much in the previous videos about this is one of the profile points of the giants, okay? They worked with stone. They worked with building material, sand, um, gravel, etc. Okay, they knew about these things. This is one of the things they specialized in. When the Algonquin moved into the territory there in upstate New York, they had to displace the peoples who were already there, okay? And they were these giant peoples who were there, who had constructed all the stone walls, okay? Although they, they probably were the Hopewell and were loyal to the Adena, who were the ruling class of their civilization when they were the Hopewell, and got all their lore from the great man, the big man, as they say, the big man, literally big man, okay, the giants in these areas were not of the type of the Adena. They weren't these aristocracy, these, you know, learned people possibly. They were just sort of people living in the wild there, these giant humanoids living in the wild there because they were friendly with the Algonquin, okay? So... Look, guys, nowhere else on YouTube or anywhere else are you going to hear any stories about the good giants. So were there bad giants? There probably were. I mean, it seems highly unlikely that there were not at least some bad giants that did bad things or whatever. You know, it seems only rational to think so. But... In the majority, it seems that they were very sophisticated and often teaching us homo sapiens about all these different things. You know, all these technologies and different things that, you know, are necessary to know about agriculture, building, etc. Okay? They had important lessons to impart upon us, and we hear about it again and again. Not only in just Algonquin legends and folklore, but as I've gone over in the previous couple of videos, they're in Europe. Okay, we keep on hearing about these people bringing, you know, technology such as metallurgy, such as agriculture, and teaching the peoples there about it. So you have basically all these good joints, but when it was necessary to call them bad, like the Iroquois had to when they needed to displace them from where they were moving into from the Ohio Valley there. They had to get away from there, from the people who were opposed to the Adena aristocracy, the ruling class. Okay, these are the kind of political things that happen today. So why should it be hardly surprising about what happened with the dynamics of the giants in the past who have a ruling class over average sized people? So you know, you have to think about these things in a sort of sociology 101 class, you know, just, just saying, okay, so 
you're never going to hear about stories about the good giants on the L.A. Marsuli channels and all kind of stuff and coast to coast and whatever else you might hear about them. Okay, folks. So, so just, you know, can you get that brainwashing out of your system for a chance and start looking at these things rationally so it can make sense out of the past? Okay, if you're following that thread and this biblical thread or whatever, you know, do you think it's we're capable of it? You know, we, you know, in a way we had to be, even by the people who, you know, are the authors of the Bible and everything. It's all okay with them and everything because, you know, we needed to occupy these lands. You know, the people, those people needed to occupy these lands. So it's no different than any story we've ever heard of the past of people displacing other peoples who occupied areas okay so as i say the whole cannibalism story is just a demonizing of the enemy and i just like to read that to you okay so just you know keep that in mind you know here we have the iroquois who talk about these bad old stone giants Okay, that they, you know, are harassing them or whatever it is. And then you have the stories of the um, the good giants, okay, and the chaos from the Algonquins, okay. So we're going to talk about it. This channel is focused on the good giants, okay. We've heard enough about the bad giants in Nepaline. Now we want to make a rational assessment of the past. Okay, we're not going with that. That was the 20th century. Okay, that's gone. Okay, now we have a new understanding. Okay, and we're going to concentrate on that so we can make more sense of the past. Okay, trust me, if you're a subscriber to this channel, you're already making much more sense of the past than anybody else anywhere. Okay, on YouTube, elsewhere, you name it. Okay, just right on this channel. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's read this story, okay, about one of the good giants or good giants from Algonquin Legends and Mythology. And it's very interesting what it says in here. I think you're going to enjoy it because it is a great story. And, uh, you know, this is from the First People website here. And it's a fantastic story. You're really going to enjoy it. The Giant Magicians and Algonquin Legend. There was once a man and his wife who lived by the sea, far away from other people. They had many children and they were very poor. One day this couple were in their canoe, far from land. There came up a dense fog. They were quite lost. They heard a noise as of paddles and voices. It drew nearer. They saw dimly a monstrous canoe filled with giants who greeted the little folk like friends. Ukin Tami Wijak, my little brother, said the leader. Where are you going? I am lost in the fog, said the poor Indian, very sadly. Ah, come with us to our camp, said the giant who seemed to be a good fellow, if there ever was one. Truly, you ye will be well treated, my small friends, for my father is the chief. So be of good cheer. And they, being much amazed at his gentleness, sat still in awe, while two of the giants, each putting a tip of his paddle under their bark, lifted it up and put it into their own, as if it had been a chip. The true, and truly, the giant seemed to be as much pleased with the little folk as a boy would be who had found a flying squirrel. And as they drew near the beach, lo, they beheld three wigwams high as mountains in size according to the giants. And coming to meet them was the chief, who was taller than the rest. Ha, ah, he cried, son, what have you there? Where did you pick up that little brother? 
No, my father, I found him lost in the fog. Well, bringing him home to the lo- bring him home to the lodge, my son. So the giant took the small canoe in the palm of his hand, and the man and his wife sitting therein, and carried them home. Then they were taken into the wigwam, and the canoe was laid carefully in the eaves, but within easy reach, about a hundred and fifty yards from the ground. It's awfully tall. <coughs> Might be a little exaggeration there. Then an abundant meal was set before them. <coughs> Excuse me. But the benevolent host, mindful of their small size, did not give them more to eat than they would have needed for about ten years to come, and informed them in a subdued whisper, which could hardly have been heard a hundred miles off, that his name was Askun. Now it came to pass, a few days after, that a company of these well-grown people went hunting, and when they returned, the guests must needs pity them, and they had no game in their land which answered to their size, for they came in with strings of such small affairs as two or three dozen caribou hanging in their belts, as a micmac would carry a string of squirrels, and swinging one or two moose in their hands like rabbits. Yet, what with these and many deer, bears, and beavers, they made up in the weight of their game what it lacked in size, and of what they had they were generous. Now the giants became very fond of the small folk, and were not for the world that they should in any way come to harm. And it came to pass that one morning the chief told them, that they were to have a grand battle, since they expected in three days to be attacked by a canoe. Therefore the Micmac saw in all things it was even with the giants as with his own people at home, they having their troubles with the wicked, and the chiefs their share in being obliged to keep up their magic and know all that was going on in the world. Yea, for he would be a poor powwow and a necromancer worth nothing who could not foretell such a trifle as the day and hour when an enemy would be on them. But this time the Sakamo or Sagamore was forewarned and bade his little guests to stop their ears and bind up their heads and roll themselves in many folds of dressed skins lest they should hear the deadly war scream of the Chinu. And with all their care, they hardly survived it. But the second scream hurt them less. And after the third, the chief came to them with a cheerful countenance and bade them arise and unpack themselves, for the monster was slain. And though his four sons, with two other giants, had been sorely tried, yet they had conquered. But the sorrows of the good are never at an end, and so it was with these honest giants, who were always being pestered with some kind of scurvy knaves or others, who would not leave them in peace. For anon the chief announced that this time a kukwis, a burly beastly villain not two points better than his cousin the Chinu, was coming to play at rough murder with them, and verily, by this time, the Micmac began to believe, without baiting an ace on it, that all of these tall people were like the wolves, who, meeting with nobody else, bite one another. So they were bound and bundled up as before, and put to bed like dolls. And again they heard the horrible shout, the moderate shout, and the smaller shout, until Sol Munu Dua Hidago, which being interpreted meaneth that they hardly heard the, him at all. Then the warriors returning gave proof that they had indeed done something more than kick the wind, for they were covered with blood, and their legs were stuck full of large pines, with here and there an oak or hemlock, for the fight had been in a forest, so they had been as much troubled as men would be would be with thistles, nettles, and pine splinters, which is truly often a great trouble. But this was their least trial, for, as they told their chief, 
the enemy had well nigh made Jack Drum's entertainment for them and led them the devil's dance. Had not one of them, by good luck, opened his eye for, for him with a rock which drove it into his brain. And as it was, the chief's youngest son had been so mauled that, coming home, he fell dead just before his father's door. Truly, this might have de been deemed almost an accident in some families, but lo, what a good thing it is to have an enchanter in the house, especially one who knows his business, as did the old chief, who, going out, asked the young man why he was lying there. To which he replying that it was because he was dead, his father bade him rise and walk, which he did straight to the supper table, and ate nonetheless for it. Now the old chief, thinking that perhaps his dear little people found life dull and devoid of incident with him, asked them if they were a, a weary of him. They, with golden truth indeed, answered that they had never been so merry, but that they were anxious as to their children at home. He answered that they were indeed right, and that the next morning they might depart. So their canoe was reached down for them, and packed full of the finest furs and best meat. When they were told to teba dikwa, or to get in, get, or get in, then a small dog was put in, and this dog was solemnly charged that he should take the people home, while the people were told to paddle in the direction in which the dog should point. And to the Micmac he said, Seven years hence you will be reminded of me. And then Tokubu Sijik, off they went. The man sat in the stern, his wife in the prow, and the dog in the middle of the canoe. The dog pointed, the Indian paddled, the water was smooth. They soon reached home, the children with joy ran to meet them, and the dog as joyfully ran to see the children, wagging his tail with great glee, just as if he had been like any other dog, and not a fairy. For having made acquaintance, he without delay turned tail and trotted off for home again, running over the ocean surface as if it had been hard ice, which might indeed have once astonished the good man and his wife, but they had of late days seen so many wonders that they were past marveling. Now this Indian, who had in the past been always poor, seemed to have quite recovered from that complaint. When he let down his lines, the biggest fish bit. All his sprats were salmon. He prayed for goslings and not geese. Moose were as mice to him now. Yea, he had the best in the land with all the fatness thereof. So seven years passed away, and then as he slept, there came to, unto him diverse dreams, and in them he went back to the land of giants, and saw all those who had been so kind to him. And yet again he dreamed one night that he was standing by his wigwam, near the sea, and that a great whale swam up to him and began to sing, and that the singing was the sweetest he had ever heard. Then he remembered that the giant had told him he would think of him in seven years, and it came clearly before him what it all meant, and that he was ere long to have magical power given to him, and that he should become a Mugumus Wesu. Okay, so that's like a, a spiritual being, a, you know, a, a supernatural being. This he told his wife, who, not being learned in darksome lore, would feign no more nearly what kind of being he expected to be, and whether a spirit or a man, good or bad, which was indeed not easy to explain, nor is it clearly set down in the chronicles beyond this, that whatever it might be, it was all for the best, and that there was a great deal of magic in it. That day they saw a great shark cruising about in their bay, chasing fish, and this they held for an evil omen. But soon after there came 
trotting towards them over the sea, the same small dog who had been their pilot from the land of the giants. So he, full of joy as before, at seeing them and the children, wagged his tail and danced for glee. And then he looked earnestly at the man as if for some message. And to him the man said, It is well. In three years' time I will make you a visit. I will look to the southwest. Then the dog licked the hands and ears and the eyes of the man and went home as before over the sea, running on the water. And when three years had passed, the Indian entered his canoe, and paddling without fear, found his way to the land of the giants. He saw the wigwam standing on the beach. The immense canoes were drawn upon the water's edge. From afar he beheld the old giant coming down to welcome him. But he was alone, and when he had been welcomed and was in the wigwam, he learned that all the sons were dead. They had died three years before when the shark, the great sorcerer, had been seen. They had gone, and the old man had but lingered a little longer. They had made the magic change, they had departed, and he would soon join them in his own kingdom. But ere he went, he would leave their great inheritance, their magic, to the man. Therewith the giant brought out his son's clothes and bade the Indian to put them on. Truly, this was as if he had been asked to close himself with a great house, since the smallest fold in them would have been to him as a cavern. But he stepped in. As he did this, he rose to great size. He filled out the garments till they fitted. He was a giant of giant land. With the clothes came the wisdom the Matulian, the Manitou power of the greatest and wisest of the old, olden time. He was indeed Magamu Wiso and had attained to the mystery. And that's the end of the story there, folks. And I thought that was a fantastic story from an Algonquin legendaire about these good giants who passed on this sort of giant power to this fellow here and you know that they were so kind and good and remembered as such you know again folks this seems to be more evidence of the giants being more of a positive contributor to our species at least our species of humanoid our homo sapien race of homo sapien okay then there is these negative aspects that want to be promoted in the few things that are said in the Bible there, okay? Which are obviously, you know, reflections of the giant genocide that seemed to go on in the past. It just, however, you know, horrible and evil it may sound, you know, that we eliminated these peoples as a species in you know, most of the areas of the planet where they existed, okay, coming into this new age as they seem to sort of, you know, disappear and die off and become assimilated into the homo sapien populations. And again, you know, some of these stories of these giants from the past, although these ones seem to be about the original ones, you know, the ones that were not hybrids, Okay, somehow hybridization occurred in the past. So many of the stories of of large peoples that we hear in historical times, large chieftains, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were these hybrid people. They were not the giants of the ancient ancient past, which seemed much taller. Okay, but again, I am going to go and go through all the profile points of the giants. And once you hear all, when anybody hears what the profile points of the giants are, then it's going to be hard to believe that these people who are so sophisticated and so advanced in many levels in their society and in their knowing and intelligence it seems hardly likely that they were cannibals, okay? It's just a demonization of the enemy, 
Okay, so let me read to you about the demonizing the enemy. Demonizing the enemy, demonization of the enemy, or dehumanization of the enemy is a propaganda technique which promotes an idea about the enemy being a threatening, evil aggressor with only destructive objectives. Demonization is the oldest propaganda technique aimed to inspire hatred towards the enemy necessary to hurt them more easily, to preserve and mobilize allies, and demoralize the enemy. Okay, and here's the basic criteria. Because of the frequent misuse of the term demonization, it is deprived of its, its potential to be analyzed. That is why Jules Boykoff defined four criteria of enemy demonization. Both media and state employ frames to betray inherent nature of so-called enemy, mostly in moral terms. The character of the opponent is depicted in a Manichaean way as good against evil, based on the old, you know, uh, Manichaean religion, ancient religion, good and evil. The state is the origin of such demonological portraying. There is no si significant counterclaim from the state, okay? The demonization of the enemy has been routinely conducted throughout the history. Thucydides recorded examples in ancient Greece. Philip Knightley believed that demonization of the enemy, first enemy leaders and later enemy individuals, became a predictable pattern followed by Western media, the final stage being atrocities. During the Second World War, propaganda documentaries that contained enemy demonization and flag-waving patriotism were prepared by the U.S. State Department and other state institutions of the United States and distributed after being approved. Personification and demonization. Demonization of an enemy can be much easier to conduct if the enemy is personalized in one man, such as Kaiser Wilhelm II, who was demonized by Russian popular media during the First World War. Consequences, okay. Here's what Machiavelli said about it, okay, and it's all going to read about it. I hold it to a sign of great prudence in men to refrain alike from threats and from the use of insulting language, for neither of these things deprives the enemy of his power, but the first puts him more on his guard, while the other intensifies his hatred of you and makes him more industrious in devising means to harm you. So, Machiavelli thought it was a bad thing. The strategy of demonization of the enemy unavoidably leads to a vicious cycle of atrocities, which was elaborated by many authors, including Karl von Clausewitz. Demonization of the enemy makes diplomatic solution impossible and inevitably leads into the war or worsening of relations. Depicting the enemy is particularly evil as far as feelings that make killings more easy. All right, do you understand, folks? It's all about the demonization of the enemy, folks. And they needed to demonize these people from time to time because that's what we do. None of these things about we say about them may be true, but we find it necessary to do our, our leaders do, our evil leaders. Okay. As Jimi Hendrix said in the song, Machine Gun, evil man, make me kill you. Evil man, make me, you kill me. Evil man, make me kill you, even though, you know, we're just average people. You know, we're just following our orders of our leaders, right? You know, be a pawn, you know, don't question authority. Go along with everything, and that's what we do, folks. Okay, we're screaming USA, USA, and you know, we're involved with these illegal wars against people who have stand no chance against us ever. Our armies and military is so powerful, we can squash anybody in the world like a bug if we want to. Okay. There's never anything to fear from any of these people. It's never. They could stop everything anytime they wanted to with complete savagery. But they refrain from doing that because 
they'd rather convince you to go along with their barbarity. As Lieutenant General Smedley Butler said, the most, one of the most decorated veterans in American history wrote a book called War is a Racket. Okay, because he realized that his guys died. Okay, he was the commandant of the Marine Corps. Okay, he realized his guys died for corporate interest. And it pissed him off. Okay, if you're not going to take the words, words of one of the most Ameri decorated American veterans in American history, then I don't know who you're going to take it from. You know, some nobody, you know, just, you know, war hawk, jerk off, okay, who's a, you know, uh, you know, pa you know, pathological killer in reality, you know, join the military so you get to kill people. Anyway, guys, I'm sorry if you come to this channel looking for the Catalytic Giants, but we're here, we're out to prove different. I hate to disappoint you. If you want that stuff, go back to L.A. Marzulino's old 20th century and ancient history ideas about the Giants and everything. Here we're going to come to a rational conclusion about the history of this planet. Okay, not based on all those propaganda tales. Okay, it's okay. We can admit it to ourselves. All right, this is what we do. All right, the giants weren't cannibals and all kind of stuff. You know, if they ever were, they were just like anybody as far as it just seems to be evidence today of cannibalistic homo sapiens and old cannibalistic giants around. That's all I know. There's real cannibals living today that are just average homo sapiens, right? No giant cannibals around. Well, that's who I know is around. Okay, maybe it's the regular human beings who are cannibals and giants who are tool eaters like the Lovelock people are eating aquatic plants. Okay, not baby eaters or man eaters or children eaters or anything like that. Tool eaters, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so... They're calling them tool eaters in the ancient past. I sound like a pussycat. Meow, meow. All right. So, anyway, guys, if you like that little tale there from Algonquin about the good giants, if you love the good giants, thumbs up, guys. Okay? Because that's what the story's really about. Forget about all that other crap, okay? Just leave it alone, all right? They're giving you a misinformation. That's all they're doing there. Here we're getting to the bottom of it. Do you believe that? Okay, you have to if you've been following along on this channel. You just have to. I mean, it's hard to deny. All right. Anyway, guys, please hit the thumbs up. And if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe because here's where you're going to get an education about the Giants, not anywhere else. Okay. So, join up. All right, guys. Anyway. Budcat7, signing out. Peace.